Good evening. I am Alex Halliday, uh, and I'd like to welcome you to the Columbia Climate School Earth Series event. Um, a lot has changed since we last met. Uh, the COVID threat waxes and wanes, uh, but has diminished to an encouraging degree uh, in certain parts of the world anyway. Uh, however, we join you at a time of great peril for the people of Ukraine in particular. Uh, war is kind of the opposite of what we seek to achieve with sustainability. It is about deliberate destruction and loss of life. Sometimes war seems the least bad option, but this is not such a conflict. Such a tragic yet deliberate humanitarian crisis can make us feel helpless or even hopeless. And while we are here tonight to talk about matters of urgency around the state of our planet, it's also important to acknowledge this trauma and hardship. Tonight, of course, we train our focus on the global climate crisis, which is predicted to lead to massive loss of life, but over a longer term than the Ukraine war. Earlier this month, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN's chief climate science team, reported grim findings. Among them, that climate change has already had an adverse impact on billions of people around the world, especially marginalized communities. It found some species and ecosystems have suffered irreversible losses, especially people and natural systems affected by melting glaciers and rising seas. So tonight we are focusing specifically on solutions to one of global warming's most profoundly dangerous consequences, sea level rise. I'm joined by two of the climate school's leading experts who specialize in understanding and responding to the way climate change is threatening our coastal societies. Kate Orff is a professor at Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, where she is also director of the Urban Design Program. Kate is a very distinguished architect herself. She is the first landscape architect to ever win a MacArthur Genius Grant. She is known for leading complex, creative, and collaborative projects that advance both environmental and social choices. Kate has authored several books and is the founding principal of SCAPE, a design-driven landscape architecture and urban design studio based in New York. And with us, we also have Marco Tedesco, who is a research professor of marine geology and geophysics at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and an adjunct scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, which is above Tom's restaurant at, on Broadway, if you want to know where it is. He's also currently a climate resident scientist at the Columbia Business School, where he is teaching a class entitled Climate Justice, Real Estate, and vulnerability. His research focuses on polar regions, sea level rise, and the implications of climate change on the economy and real estate. He authored the book, The Hidden Life of Ice, Dispatches from a, Disappear uh, from a Disappearing World. And Marco is among the worst, most well-respected and quoted polar experts in the world. So um, let me start off with asking, as I always do, a little bit about how you started this. And uh, Kate, maybe I could kick off with you. Um, your approach to sea level rise and its impacts takes its cue from nature. Your work deals specifically with long-term adaptation using very innovative strategies, but your beginnings were rooted in landscape architecture. How did you come to develop this, this focus? Well, over a long period of time, I would say I started really thinking and when I was say 25 or so in landscape architecture curriculum that I could shape the, the natural world or that I could bring you know, public spaces into the urban environment. But then since that time, thanks to Columbia scientists and, and other scientists uh, you know, ringing the bell and, and uh, shouting from the rooftops that the seas are rising, the temperatures are warming, uh, you know, wildfires are getting more intense, we have flashier rain events. I very quickly pivoted after getting my degree to thinking much more that the, the task at hand is not just 
designing within the frame of a site, but it's really designing to help society adapt at this very, very much larger frame of reference with a very different um, scale and a very different set of ambitions. So that's that's what um, my, we are trying to do at, at GSAP, which is the architecture school at, at, at Columbia. We're really trying to focus on, you know, how can we reshape our environment? How can we kind of co-create and assist communities in this adaptation process uh, and and what what would that mean what would that mean uh, to adapt equitably in the world that we live in now thank you great marco um your path to polar exploration um and climate science began in italy where you studied electrical engineering how did you get from there to here and work on the economics and societal implications of climate change yeah thanks alex thanks everybody for having me uh it, it's um it's an it's a usual path like everybody with a passion you basically create a job that doesn't exist and I, everything started with my electrical engineering then phd in physics studying electromagnetics and snow then working in greenland uh, and looking at greenland from space uh, with satellites then uh, models and then uh, going there to real see with the reality with your eyes uh, the, uh, I've been doing this, I fell in love with the medium, um, snow and ice, the community um, for, and I've been in that community for about 20 years now, uh, but also specifically with the topic that we're talking tonight, uh, about five or six years ago, uh, I was sitting at a Joe's Cafe at Columbia and I was thinking about how do I benefit also from the beautiful opportunity I have at Columbia uh, it's like being a kid in a candy store where you can really tackle a lot of work uh, from the best. And I wanted to have an impact that was going beyond the uh, study of providing numbers, which are very important concerning sea level rise. And I was thinking extending geographically, but then a sort of illumination, I realized maybe I can start doing something that has a more short term impact on the socioeconomic. Uh, I started to look more on the economic side. And uh, I was very lucky and I'm very grateful to the people at Columbia and the business school, especially Jeffrey Hill, uh, who was a great mentor for me in that regard. And uh, I started since then. Uh, I put all my passion in it and uh, um, I started this parallel line of work, which some people might think it's a little bit um, dual or opposite. But in reality, for me, it's almost closing the loop, going from the melting of the green ice sheet sea level rise and implications for our society, especially for the vulnerable people. So I feel very grateful to Colombia and this great opportunity to continue collaborating and working on these topics. So that's great. Good. So, um, so two wonderful people, uh, very engaged. Uh, let me ask you, Marco, a bit about the IPCC report that's just come out. Um, you researched the drivers and physical processes of sea level rise. What is your understanding of where we are now? Where Were there any surprises for you in the IPCC report? Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, there were not surprises uh, in the sense that the IPCC, as we all know, it does synthesize the existing body of knowledge. So for the experts, for us, uh, it was almost known. And unfortunately, I have to say there were deals it's meaning that we did not see improvements, of course, with respect to the previous ones. And of course, we got more bad news as the acceleration of the sea level rise continues and, uh, of course, the warming of our planet. Um, the uh, important thing is that, of course, in, we're trying to we're continue understanding better, not just the single processes, but the interaction among the different processes, both physical, socioeconomic, and what we call the compounding effects. Uh, having a high tide today and uh, a strong storm and uh, in strong rain is much worse than having it 30, 40, 50 years ago, just because the sea level is, is higher. Uh, let's remember also from the IPCC point of view, I think it's very important to, uh, to contextualize the fact that there's a lot of emphasis historically for, um, for good reasons in the sense that there was a lot of fight and uh, uh, for skepticism in the past about the physical understanding of the processes. But the IPCC has been historically also looking at the social implications, the economic implications, and somehow those aspects have been um, not uh, receiving the proper attention in the past because there was this fight happening. It was almost like looking at uh, a 
lions fighting in one side, but you know there was something going on on the other side, and nobody was paying attention to that. So um, this has been uh, very important, and it's very important. And now, with the new administration, with the, all the emphasis that is happening in the United States and in the world, these aspects, the socioeconomic aspects, are um, put in a, on, a, on a stage. And, and I think we should also focus more uh, on this uh, uh, side of the IPCC. And this to me is a very important aspect, of course. So last summer you were part of a team that published the Socioeconomic Physical Housing Eviction Risk uh, or CFA data set. Uh, it integrates socioeconomic information with risk from wildfires, drought, coastal flooding, and other hazards, plus financial information from real estate databases um, and ethnicity, race, and gender data. What were you? What were the goals around this project? I guess it follows on from a little bit what you were just saying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is a thanks, Alex. Um, uh, it, it's almost uh, uh, when you spend your time in Greenland, every data you collect, every point is so precious because it takes so much. So I, I grew up professionally. Uh, valuing a lot the importance of, uh, of data, of course. And uh, when I started to look around, uh, I felt very uncomfortable with the fact that a lot of the data sets that were available for real estate uh, studies within the climate change context, they were proprietary information of commercial companies. Uh, I believe that you know some of the aspects where we can start improving climate justice, it comes from data democracy, which that we live in a data-rich environment, but not all the data is available to all the people in the same way. And I did realize there is a lot of public data available around that was simply there, difficult to be discovered um, and very uh, difficult to be used for some purposes. So I wanted to create, uh, uh, I wanted to put my skills of dealing with data at a public service uh, for supporting some of these activities. And uh, I, I always call CIFR, not rocket science, but the fuel that might propel rocket science, because without that, uh, it, it's gonna be more difficult for especially the community leaders and those who are not data experts, but are data literate to be able to access that information. So that was the goal. Uh, we published CIFR, as you mentioned, uh, he received a great success and uh, it is publicly available, of course, made from publicly available data sets. And the main goal was, of course, to target uh, the ethnicity, gender, and uh, some other uh, issues like racial segregation or other aspects uh, related to real estate, but also uh, now concerning climate change. Yeah, that's hugely important. Um, so let's switch to Kate. Um, Kate, um, you've been leading the way on the emerging approach to climate resilience that argues that we should be building with nature. Uh, not just in nature. So can you explain that? How would you describe the guiding principles of what you do? Yeah. Well, I guess I would say that we just have to recognize and value that there is immense protective benefit in robust natural systems. And those systems have sustained, sustained us for, for, you know, for, for centuries. Um, those systems include, you know, healthy, intact forests that might clean and filter our water and our air. They might include uh, oyster reefs to help protect and buffer uh, our shores. They might include coral reefs uh, to help slow, slow water uh, and, and help um, reduce the impact of cyclones. They might include mangroves uh, to help uh, uh, reduce wave action and, and filter and clean the water and protect and stabilize the shore. So what, what we're facing now is, is, is twofold, right? So we have not only the incredible, you know, to use Marco's term, the compound effects of sea level rise, temperature change, et cetera. We also have, you know, um, the disappearance or that the, these, these, these systems are very, very much under threat. So when I've traveled uh, around the world with the Columbia Urban Design Studio and with our work at the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes, you can put your eyes on reality and actually see uh, disappearing wetlands. You can see salinification. You can see the interrelationships of all of these climate factors on the natural world. So we're twofold, right? We're continuing to burn uh, at fossil fuels. We're continuing to um, pump CO2 into the air. And at that same time, we can no longer count on the protective benefit of this backdrop of nature that has that we've 
frankly, taken for granted uh, for so long. And so, you know, whether or not, you know, it's one phrase that uh, is, is, is common now is nature-based infrastructure, right? Or nature-based solutions. And so, however we want to call it, uh, we do need to, in my mind, very aggressively and, and, and creatively reinvest and invest and in building back those systems because the threats that we face are not, it's not one dimension of a threat. It's not simply that sea levels are rising. It's that we have flashier uh, rain events. It's the, it's the interrelationship of these things. So I can't think of a, a, a better investment for not only sustainability of the human world, but also of the biodiversity and the natural world uh, to um, uh, then, then actually really investing and, and protecting and rebuilding the systems that, that once sustained us. But what's important is it's not just rewilding, it's not just nature as it was. What mm -hmm. I've worked on with Lamont scientists and others is really through a series of iterative modeling processes using GIS and integrated computer modelings, wave models, and so on. We're really bringing the spatial tools of design together with advanced uh, hydrodynamic modelling to understand where are these natural systems best placed now to provide maximum protective benefit to communities at risk. Uh, and so that's um, and pairing those natural systems with what <laughs> what will work what 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 is what emerges from that place not what is descending onto that place and where it'll have the best most benefit for you know local people is really what what I've been focused on we're doing that in Staten Island and and also we're studying right now in our urban design studio uh, the Belize barrier reef uh, which is at risk and uh, has a whole set of uh, you know related challenges between declining you know livelihoods and fish stocks and increasing just coastal vulnerability because of its uh, depletion and its uh, imperiled nature. Mm. Well, wow, fantastic. So more to ask you about that, um, Marco. Just to switch back to you. Um, you've mainly focused on polar regions, and you're famous for that work, and you've written a book on it. Uh, ex particularly extreme melting in Greenland and the dynamics of the seasonal snowpack, but you've shifted your attention to environmental justice and coastal communities and sea level change. What's this, um, tell me about this shift and where has it led you? Because you seem to be now mainly focused on Miami and those sorts of areas. Yeah. Yeah, Alex, uh, I, I have to go into a little personal story there. I was driving during the pandemic in October 2020 in the car, and I have to thank somebody, someone called Halba Hernandez, who is a Miami resident, and she was the subject of a documentary uh, on Miami. Uh, she was being evicted. She was receiving a lot of uh, raise in the rent, uh, doubling within months. Uh, victim of what we call climate gentrification. Now we colleagues who are working with Jesse Keenan and others. And uh, that story really moved my heart, both because, of course, we've been hypersensitive to, of course, more, uh, more stories during the pandemic. But at the same time, I, I thought, why am I spending all this time at home looking at Greenland when maybe there is a community nearby who might help, might need uh, the help of my, uh, of my expertise. And, and at that point, uh, I, I think everything was almost. Oh. Uh, looks like we've got an internet problem there. Okay, should we move on to you, Kate? I'll come back to uh, uh, to to Marco in a minute. Um, um, so I, I think, uh, okay, Marco, you've got think, an internet problem. I'm back, but I have a problem. Yeah, yeah okay. can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Do you want to try carrying okay, on? Okay, I'm going to turn on the video in a second. I apologize. I just wanted to finish. But uh, basically what happened is that I started to, to feel more uh, compelled to work with these communities. And, uh, and the idea uh, of being able to provide support uh, not only for them but for policy makers uh, and for those leaders to to have access to these tools to to have literally uh, power in their hands to be empowered uh, by by future actions this was really the driver and uh, eight months later CIFR was born and we were able to deliver CIFR to more than 30 institutions and now it's been 
uh, consider for many uh, activities already ongoing. Yeah, okay, that's great. I should explain to our listeners that Marco is in Amsterdam at midnight and it's, I guess they 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 crank down the internet at midnight, I don't know what it is. Anyway, so, uh, um, only joking. Uh, Kate, um, you have several problem, projects. Uh, you've established these and actually you've got another's, others that are on the, work, on the way. Um, which are you most excited about? What is your vision of the most aspirational outcome? What, is, what do you think you, what do you think would be brilliant to achieve? Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say the thing that I'm most focused on right now is adaptation and implementation because we, we have so many tools that are available to us and the trick is to implement and apply them in this equitable context. So one, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the project because the project focuses energy. It focuses regulatory uh, change. It focuses coalition building and so on. So I am a big advocate of the project. And one, one project that we have under construction now in, in Raritan Bay in the New York landscape is called Living Breakwaters. And it is a, um, uh, a giant <laughs> over almost two mile long uh, breakwater that's seeded with oysters by the Billion Oyster Project that reduces wave action, that sort of replenishes the shoreline, that brings back this three-dimensional mosaic of, uh, of subtital habitat that's been lost over the past century. Uh, and it really kind of reduces climate risk. Uh, that the, the part of South Staten Island uh, um, got hit very hard by Superstorm Sandy with incredible wave action. And so basically it was left vulnerable. So this project was it's interesting and innovative, innovative also through how it received funding. So it was uh, funded by the federal government through uh, a tranche of Superstorm Sandy uh, uh, money uh, that, was, that was aimed to come to our region uh, to help build back differently. So millions and millions and millions of dollars went into many, many different things. And a, and a piece, a small sliver of that went to this innovation and infrastructural project. So um, I feel it's really exciting because even this project, which was I had worked on in various contexts with, with hydrodynamic modelers and, and with a whole suite of different partners, this project took almost 10 years uh, to realize, right? So we're coming to the 10th anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, and we're hoping to have an event at Columbia in the in the fall to, to discuss that. But this was a pro, you know, so I um the project cuts through the federal, state, and local needs, which most big infrastructure projects need to do, uh, and is really advancing this model of resilience that is about kind of community-based change and ecological restoration. Uh, but I guess all, that is to say that that was 10 years, so I am truly taking that to heart moving into the future, which is that we need to, frankly, adapt now, think about the um, you know, the decarbonization projects, the clean energy projects, the green infrastructure, blue infrastructure projects that we need to implement in order to really meet the changing climate. And think how fast that needs to happen at the rate that we are pumping carbon into the atmosphere. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm excited about the Living Breakwaters project, but it has also taught me many, many things about why it is difficult to implement um, innovative infrastructure projects at a scale. So I think my, okay. yeah. So, I mean, going on from that, I just wanted to, didn't want to interrupt you, but could yeah. you say a bit more about, I mean, you normally work on, you've thought about waterways and waterscapes as yeah. a key part of your work. Um, how does this serve the increasing urgency needed for climate change solutions? And you started talking about it there in terms of the, you know, our dependence on carbon and oil extraction, et cetera. Uh, how does this translate yeah. into the poorest communities in the world? Well, I, I've seen around the world this very, very direct relationship water systems and the world's poor, just very direct. So whether that's been in Calcutta, India, whether that has been in Kanta, Vietnam, uh, you know, uh, Madurai, India, Varanasi, India, Rio de Janeiro, all of the cities, we've, we've done a series of studios called Water Urbanism that's looking at climate change in global cities through this lens of water. And it's the poorest of the poor who are dependent upon healthy water systems and dependent upon um, subsistence fisheries uh, economies. And so 
climate change has profoundly impacted the water cycle. And uh, it's these, these cultural ties and these livelihood ties that are so. Oh, wow. We're freezing up tonight. Marco, let's get you back. This is, let's see if we can start there. Last summer, you and other climate scientists, Marco, um, recorded daily melt rates in the Arctic um, that were seven times higher than normal. Um, so can you tell us a bit about that? Should this sound a new level of alarm? Uh, Marco, I can't get you either. Sure, Alex. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm now connected with my phone. So <laughs> okay. I'm trying to reset all the electricity because for some reason they blow up I know, the entire neighborhood here. So I don't know what happened. Oh, dear. Okay. Okay. So should we go back to Kate? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Alex. This has been spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I guess I'll just say that that you know where we worked in 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 these places like Kanta, Vietnam, you can really see that the poor, you know, are, there's incredible dependence on water systems, and whether it's sea level rise, salinification, desertification, waterborne disease, too much water, too, you know, there's a there's a sort of, you know there's a confluence of, of the, the poorest of the poor now with climate change and with risks to water. And so we've seen million, you know, millions of lives are at stake, many, many lives and livelihoods hang in the balance. So that's the reason that I focused on water and urban design in global cities. Right, got it. So Marco, are you back yet or not? Yes. Okay, okay. I thought, okay. Thank you guys. Sorry for that. The internet is back. Everything should be fine. I apologize for it. It's all right. It's pretty dark over there in Amsterdam. Okay, so uh, so last summer, you and other climate scientists recorded daily melting rates in the Arctic. Yeah. Uh, that were seven times higher than normal. So this sounds dramatic. Should this, should we, should we be worried or do you think this is just a temporary fluctuation or what? Well, you know, we, we know that every year we're assist to new records day after day, think about, uh, you know, rain in Greenland at uh, 10,000 feet, for example, for the first time in historical record. A few days ago, both poles uh, were melting at the same time, despite one was in winter, one was in summer, uh, with temperatures above up to 10 degrees Celsius above the mean. Um, in the same case, also uh, the melting of, from the ice sheet, and especially Greenland, will continue to accelerate and so will sea level rise. Um, this will continue to impact coastlines. Um, and of course, Antarctica, it's a big unknown. The West Antarctica ice sheet contains enough water to, um, to basically as much as Greenland in terms of sea level rise contribution. And we know that West Antarctica is waking up. It's a few days ago, the news that also at the, for the first time in historical record, um, a big ice shelves, about um, 200 uh, square miles, uh, 250 square miles broke up in East Antarctica. Now we still don't know whether it's this climate change related or else, but uh, we have all the signals showing that for sure there will be more and more acceleration, especially thinking that the ocean also is playing a huge role in melting uh, the ice shelves in Antarctica, which even though they're already in the ocean, so they will not contribute to sea level rise, they are a great way to protect the ice from flowing faster toward the ocean. So the removal of those ice tongs, the ice shelves, is extremely uh, important because it will favor the flow of the ice from the, uh, from the ice sheets toward the ocean. Uh, the Marco, Marco, can you just explain something you just said earlier on, which I thought, I just sure. want to interrupt you. You said that, um, we had to see whether this uh, massive ice sheet uh, uh, breaking off, whether, yes, this, yeah. whether this was caused by climate change. Could you just quickly explain, because I think most people just assume now these are climate change things. Yeah. Are there, are there ways in which it might not be climate change? Yes, in reality, uh, we, we made a study with, you know, led by Robin Bell uh, a few years ago. The ice shelves, are, uh, they break up. They can break up naturally. Uh, nice. Cracks in the ice shelves 
uh, can be made by mechanical stress because they flow and then one part, it, it, imagine like a chocolate bar when you try to bend it and then you put it back, there's some cracks in the top part of the chocolate. Uh, and then uh, you also have, because of melting, the water, surface melt water percolates through these cracks and it, it makes the ice shelves weaker. Now, if you have more melt water because of the warming or because of the uh, increase of, uh, of potential melting, that can be a cause for acceleration of breakup uh, of the ice shelf, which of course we know this happened in, the, in part of the West Antarctica, like in the peninsula. Uh, what happened on the East Antarctica, however, is thought to be the effect of what is called an atmospheric river, which is this basically river of warm, moist air that comes from, in this case, from the northern part of, uh, of the ocean, and it blows all this warm and, and, and literally full of energy air that can create this melting. This ice shelf, the Conger ice shelf, was already relatively unstable because of mechanical stresses. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, it's very difficult because it's a one-time case. Uh, it, it would be cherry picking to make a claim. For sure, uh, we need to look, of course, uh, how the weakening of the ice shelves and how much the warming of Antarctica and the ocean, of course, surrounding oceans, is playing a contributing role to these effects now. And this creates also an incredible opportunity for us to understand what happens to the glaciers behind these ice shelves in East Antarctica after we study West Antarctica. Uh, so there's an anticipation that with the warming planet, there will be more collapse of several ice shelves. And this has been also the reason why there's been a revision of the future projection sea level rise over the past years, uh, following some studies showing, uh, including Robin Ben, Alexandra Bogosian also was a PhD student in Lamont, uh, showing these effects. So, I mean, uh, I want to make sure we don't run out of time. I've got lots of questions for you still, but could you just quickly say, uh, do you feel society is responding correctly to this? And, and also, where are you most worried about in terms of sea level rise? Is this for me or for Kate? For you. Okay, yes. I think the society is starting to respond. Uh, and uh, we still have some work to do to be able to uh, distribute the government efforts to the, uh, to the bottom of, of, the, uh, of the pyramid that unfortunately still exists and to the communities who need uh, this kind of support. Uh, I think what we really... Uh, need to very work very hard is uh, to um, to address environmental justice and climate justice uh, for uh, again including the socioeconomic aspect in the impacts of climate change not only from a physical perspective but of course from a, a, a social vulnerability uh, perspective um, the policies uh, have been implemented and signed by uh, governments in pre previous administrations, uh, including you know, Barack Obama and Bill Clinton about environmental justice, but there's been very little effort about um, making the federal agencies to also follow these rules. This is something that is happening now with the Biden administration. And importantly, we really need to work very hard to empower the communities. Uh, we need to continue finding a way to distribute the, uh, the, the knowledge in a way that become empowering these communities. It's almost like creating energy without having the infrastructure to distribute it. Once it's stored there, it, it becomes useless some of the work. So that infrastructure that connects the production of the energy, in this case, the knowledge with the final stakeholders, the users, which are the exposed communities, that is really an important key point that uh, needs to be addressed from uh, several aspects. Okay, okay, this is great. So uh, this actually leads nicely to a question I was going to ask both of you, maybe I could focus on Kate, and that is, um, how do you feel this disproportionate distribution of, of climate consequences can be alleviated? I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your tidal communities work, Kate. Yeah, well, tidal communities in particular was, was a seminar and a kind of multi-college uh, university effort to really focus on listening and listening to the stories of rural communities at risk. And so we, we convened um, uh, 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 people and community members from Shishmaref, uh, from the Alaskan native villages, 
uh, to uh, Gullah Geechee on the barrier islands of uh, Georgia and uh, uh, South Carolina uh, to uh, the Shinnecock Nation uh, right here in, in New York and Long Island. And um, rather than, you know, trying to provide solutions, so to speak, it was a really intensive process of, of listening and learning from their stories and then essentially kind of convening and understanding, you know, what, what, these, what these different communities are facing. And these are communities in the United States that are, um, are imperiled, full stop. And, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was quite instructive for me because I, I do feel like what, you know, what is the task now is to define what is equitable adaptation? What does that mean? And, and at least I felt like I learned quite a bit from this process of listening. I mean, there are, this word empowerment comes over and over again. These communities do not want to feel victimized by climate. climate. They want to feel like they have the tools to make decisions and to act. Uh, and to act in their own interest. So, um, you know, but, and they've seen literally this very, very slow, gradual process of the landscape essentially collapsing in different ways around them. Um, so this notion of empowerment, this notion of how we need to uh, step up, frankly, in the, in the academic sub sector and kind of weave together financial tools, spatial tools, <laughs> legal tools uh, and, and, and other forms of very, very applied, applied tools for, for communities to be able to choose uh, and you know, whether or not to try to adapt in place or to feel empowered to be able to make a positive change uh, to retreat. Uh, and so one, th one other, another piece or another aspect that came out of this scenario was that in the case of Shish Maref, they had voted three times to retreat, but hadn't received you know, funding or support uh, to enable them to do that. So I really feel like there's a massive role for places like Columbia, other schools, colleges, universities, et cetera, to play, to really work on connecting the dots here. We all live in this very siloed world of like FEMA, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this, you know, EPA, uh, very, very different, whether it's the federal government, state or, or local government, we're all working in these silos. But the fact is that the, the, the solution space is going to come in bringing many of these things together and working in a very collaborative and creative way to empower communities to, to, to make these choices and choices that will positively impact their 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 lives okay so we're going to run out of time soon and i'm going to have to switch to audience questions so um i wanted to uh just ask a couple more questions maybe if you could answer brief you know succinctly um so um i guess one of the first things to say is just quickly from both of you is um there's increasing evidence of irreversible and escalating consequences how does this affect how you feel about your work? And do, do you feel your career is changing because of what's happening around you? Marco, do you want to kick off? Yeah, sure. Uh, definitely, Alex. Um, I, as I was mentioning, I think I, 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 I think about the big picture and then I, I feel, of course, powerless about the big processes and the role I have, of course, despite we contribute, as Kay was mentioning, from you know different institutions. But the the fact this motivates me even more to I, I try to turn my I wouldn't say anger but my discomfort into some short-term actions that are not 100 years from now but five ten years to improve communities uh, especially when I think about intergenerational climate justice I feel very close the kids today who will pay the consequences of living in some areas and they will have to, you know, die basically for heat waves or other things just because they belong to a specific community. So mm -hmm. this motivates me even more, and uh, I hope that some of the work we're doing is uh, contributing to both the short term and the long term scale by providing again tools that uh, then can be applied uh, somehow. Kate, do you want to? How does it change how you feel and what you're doing? I, I guess I would just say I feel an incredible time pressure right now in a way that I have never felt that. I, I'm a, a person who loves landscapes, coastal landscapes, wetlands, <laughs> reefs, and, and we have a, there's a phenomenon called the coastal squeeze, right, which is sea levels are rising higher and higher and you have an, uh, a built up shoreline and essentially 
we're facing, you know, dire consequences for, for literally the wetlands uh, around, um, around the world that, that, that have sustained us. And it's, it's a matter of the rate of sea level rise. It's, it's like the time pressures now could not be more, more intense. So I feel, um, um, you know, I feel the pressure of seeing this coastal landscape disappearing, frankly. Uh, I feel intense urgency. I feel more radicalized. <laughs> I, I feel like 10 years is too long to, to develop an adaptation project. Um, I feel frustration, um, but I also, you know, feel, feel a, a need to just dig in and do the very hard, messy work because mm -hmm. I, I do feel like that truly adaptation, ad adaptive work and ad adaptation work is, is, is messy and it takes time and that it's a, it's a process that we are all going through and it's not necessarily a solution that you can pluck out of the air and just apply. So I'm, I'm digging in for the hard work. Okay, so we got a couple of minutes and I'm going to switch to the audience Q&A, but I just wanted to, I always ask, my final question is always, if there was one take-home message from tonight uh, that you'd like people to remember, what would it be? Marco, do you want to say just quickly? Yes, uh, I would say um, be, uh, be courageous to approach the people like us from where you want to get information uh, and, and let us understand more that uh, we need to put our feet on the ground because I perceive myself as a, an applied scientist nowadays. And I think uh, the, the questions that come from me are important as a scientist, but it's not anymore for me the time to play the scientist who wanna look at the next question in his head and he loves the physics behind. For me, it's time to, to be told, these are the questions we need. Uh, provide your service to our society uh, that's, and, and, and do it in the best way you can and so we can develop the best tools. So um, please use us as much as you can and abuse us in, in, in an intellectual way. That's, that's very important. Kate, what about you? Yeah. Well, everything we're talking about is under this umbrella of deep decarbonization. So I would say start with decarbonizing, but then adapt now, you know, and that adaptation is not a solution that descends on a place. It's really something that emerges. It's a process that involves a lot of place-based thinking uh, and uh, deeply collaborative, messy, hard work. Great. Okay. So thank you both. I'm going to now switch to Q&A. Q&A. We've got some great questions coming in. We've got a lot, large number of people here tonight. Um, so um, here's one question. What are some of the best ways for recent graduates to become involved in climate resilience and green infrastructure work? Kate, that sounds like one for you. Well, I found that well, with recent graduates, like we're expressing here, there can be the sense that, that there's too much and it's overwhelming. And so the way that I try to act is knowing that there are people like Marco and other people in, the, in, in government and, and, and private industry that are all in their roles and delivering on what they can do. So my suggestion to the graduate student is to find the facet in which you feel like you can best contribute. You know, we're both, Marco and I are both have invented our own, uh, you know, what we're doing now, right? What I'm doing now didn't really exist 20 years ago. And I imagine that would be the same thing for the student. It's not just that you're a lawyer and with climate on the side, somehow dealing in climate will transform law itself, et cetera, et cetera. So I would try to match yeah, the unique experience and, and, and what you enjoy doing. Uh, and what you can bring to the process with that need in the world. Don't feel like you have to do everything. Don't get frustrated by the time scales. Define the, that facet that you can that can you can you can contribute to, and that could be in a local nonprofit, that could be in a parks department, that could be in, in government through policy. Uh, but just uh, don't don't delay and 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 find that slice in the world for you to contribute to. That's great. Okay, so I'm gonna ask another question. I'm gonna give this one to Marco. Um, Marco, in terms of estimating the time frame for rising seas, um, has the impact of melting permafrost been factored in? Yeah, uh, well, the, the thawing of a permafrost is really not directly contributing to the sea level rise, but it's creating a huge problem, which is the methane emission. 
uh, methane is a greenhouse gas that is 80 times more powerful than CO2, but it has a much shorter time span. Um, so bottom line, what we're doing now with the thawing of the permafrost, it's almost like going on a car that is like slowly accelerating, that's your sea level rise, but we're having some push of gas every now and then, so the, the car goes faster and faster. This is what happens when methane uh, is pumped into the atmosphere. The question is really that we don't know exactly, and we think it's a lot, of the methane stored with the permafrost. And so we expect that uh, the consequences of this, which is already occurring beside the infrastructure, and especially is hitting a lot of uh, uh, Native American uh, villages and towns in Alaska and the Northern Canada, uh, this has a huge impact on their lives, but also it will have a huge impact on the short term um, uh, greenhouse gases effects. And so beside sequestering CO2, beside uh, reducing CO2 emission, uh, there are other gases like, of course, methane that we need to account for. Fortunately, there are some efforts now uh, from remote sensing and other efforts to quantify methane distribution so we can somehow control better the emission and have a better regulatory uh, tool in this regard. Okay, this is great. So, Kate, uh, what are your thoughts about how we can expedite the implementation of nature-based infrastructure solutions, someone asks. How do we move faster on this? I love this question. <laughs> I would say, yes, yes, we have to move faster. And I've been trying to think of different ways to do that because, you know, knowing too much, I guess, working in the world of complex regulatory environments, um, many things are just set up to, to prohibit that from happening, just to be yeah, very right. blunt. Um, so, but I, I mean, I've tried to put forward this kind of notion of starting with big transformational landscape ideas, right? Like re-envisioning the Mississippi as a living river, right? <laughs> gradually removing the dikes and levees to enable the Delta to gradually replenish uh, itself, uh, equitably moving people out of harm's way that have experienced repeat flooding, um, or thinking about the transformative power of uh, an, an interconnected American shoreway that could uh, a public realm that could be buffered and, and uh, uh, re-nourished in terms of its beaches to protect vulnerable communities. So we have to both think big, but then we have to attack, if you will, the, the regulatory environment that prohibits uh, many of these uh, things from happening. And those, those are um, uh, uh, sort of methodological, like the the uh, antiqu antiquated cost benefit analysis that the core uses to decide what is a useful project. Um, there's regulatory prohibits against prohibitions against fill and, and many other things. So we need to um, do a multi pronged policy uh, uh, and uh, process attack and enable um, more pilot projects to start now, like the time to start adapting was 10 years ago. <laughs> so the, the time really needs to be now. So there's a lot we can do uh, at these multiple levels of governance. And I think it would be great for Colombia to, to host uh, and convene um, a, a, um, a, a sort of a round table on the subject and then be able to sort of present our findings to uh, lawmakers, to the Army Corps, and, and others. I mean, we have the expertise as do many of our colleagues. Let's do it. Yeah. I mean, we already host the Manager Retreat Conference, which is all about coastal adaptation, but we should expand on that and do much more. I agree. And lots of opportunities uh, to do that. I totally agree. We should talk about that. Um, so just quickly, um, uh, there's a good question. Let's, let's throw this one at Marco. Concerning the desire to distribute knowledge of climate change regarding sea level rise impacts the vulnerable communities. How can publicly accessible online tools, such as those available from Climate Central and now from NOAA, um, be, be available to help? What are the obstacles to making them more relevant to the affected populations? We had the head of NOAA visiting us at the Lamont Valley Earth Observatory just last week, and, and, and he was very excited about what NOAA was trying to do in this space. But Marco, do you want to Tell us yeah, that. well, this is a great question, um, and uh, um, and I think it, I, what we're doing, for example, at Columbia, we're organizing a workshop to uh, teach the people uh, in the New York City areas about the CIFR data set and train community, community leaders to make maps that could show them to their communities. You know, I understand that I don't, I don't think that the 
person, lay person on a day-to-day -day basis, they already have so many issues about making it to the end of the day, uh, health issues, uh, social issues, and the stress due to, of course, to the big pressure that you feel when you live in a place that it's your home and you know you're either to leave or stay there and you know your place is going to be uh, ruined because of a lack of action. So that's very, very strong. So to answer this question, I think that those tools are amazingly important, are very powerful. But again, we start need to combine uh, those, they show the physical aspect of climate change. Uh, if you want to ask a question, for example, what is the percentage of African Americans' uh, mortgages impacted in areas where sea level rise or floods has been increasing over the years? You cannot answer these kind of questions with those data sets. And of course, uh, the, the idea we have behind is we have to have more publicly available data set infrastructure, cyber infrastructure that only allows like a, a Google style or any other big corporation with a two click, you need to be able to get what you want rather than being crazy and, 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 and moving around. And then after a few minutes, you get depressed and move basically to the next action. So data literacy, data democracy is very important. And also to add to what Kay was saying and about that, I think uh, uh, this is very important for future students to think about the data as a tool for uh, climate justice and democracy. And I, and I don't mean to say this because Alex, you're the, one of the founding deans, but of course the climate school at Columbia now is offering this amazing opportunity for students to cross collaborate, cross breed and, uh, and take classes in different disciplines and create this expertise that could save those years that Kate was mentioning were really late, but at least you don't have to spend those 10 years of doing the postdoc and PhD before you're recognized that you can do something in that field because you already have the core of expertise created by climate school and other activities like this one. Okay, so we're gonna to have to make your answers short. This is really good, very good. But we've got a ton of great questions here. So I'd like to thank the audience. So quickly, uh, can either Kate or Marco share solutions that protect urban populations and reduce harmful patterns of development? So maybe you should focus on harmful patterns of development here in particular, and the urban populations that, um, are particularly most vulnerable. Uh, you touched upon some of the social justice issues, Marco, in what you said earlier, and I know this is dear to your heart as well, Kate. Um, Kate, do you want to kick off on this and, and see what you think? I'm going to try to keep it short. I feel like okay. we're very bad at this, okay? We're very bad at this. Even after Superstorm Sandy, there was a, we will rebuild and bring back, you know, and so in the years since Sandy, we've had towers on our, our shoreline. So I, I think we need to begin to engage in a very aggressive way the, the triumvirate of legal, real estate, spatial and social mapping tools, because right now it's simply we're proceeding as we have done in, in the past past decades, right, which is real estate as of right development, etc. So we need to somehow uh, manage that uh, to keep people out of harm's way and uh, to rebuild um, you know, uh, and buffer out the shoreline rather than place a new building on the shoreline that we then have to spend taxpayer money to protect. Right. Yeah, and I'll be short, Alex. Uh, yep. I, I have two sentences. The first one, please uh, look at a, a book, a fantastic book called a Race, um, uh, Race for Profit, which talk about their history of real estate and uh, social segregation and racial segregation. It tells you about also why real estate uh, is acting the way it's acting. And of course, that's a big problem. Uh, and the second is um, we need to start thinking and investing in human capital rather than financial capital. Right. That we need to shift uh, yeah. this. As long as we don't do that, there will be always vulnerable people will be on the way of harmful patterns, physical patterns. So in a similar line, there's a question here. Many Pacific Islands have no option for adapting. Any suggestions? What do you suggest, Kate? Well, actually, as part of the, the Coastal Resilience Network at Columbia, we have um, the amazing Professor Paige West, who, who's done uh, much of her field work, and, and we're having a session with her next week. I mean, I feel like what this questioner is asking is existential, right? That there is truly an existential threat relative to the land not being habitable. So there's a different set of, 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 of challenges and um, reparations, frankly, that need to come into play here. And that's something we haven't talked about, but global climate justice is, is immediately 
comes to mind when I hear about Pacific Islanders uh, unable to inhabit and losing their culture. So um, there, there, there are there, there's a lot of work to do at the, at the global level uh, uh, to to begin to answer that question. Okay, so what I'd like to, I'm going to move on. There's a couple, two more quick questions. I just want one sentence from each of you on this, because uh, the first one is, I think, just food for thought. It's a great question. And maybe we should just go away and think, make a copy of this and think about it. In regard to adaptation, how would you explain <clears throat> this to someone who is grinding day to day by supporting a family, pay high rent and more? How come or does adapt adaptation show up in someone's everyday life? What does it look like? What do you think, Marco? One sentence. Uh, well, I can say what I hope it will look like. Then I will hope that adaptation will improve the quality of life of this person and will not force this person to make a choice between the needs that they already have, but will improve the quality of life of this family and, of course, of the future generations. So we're talking about social infrastructure and financial support, empowering those communities again in, in a way that is not done uh, so far. Kate, what do you think? It's a great question because it, it brings it into your daily experience, right? And it yeah. brings it into your, your sort of everyday life. I mean, this is, I would say that I feel like we have also not been asked to make what I would call sacrifices, not just for this individual, but as a, as a community, right? Like, how do we burn less carbon? How do we lower uh, our emissions? How can, you know, how can we shift our dependence on oil? And how can those things be joyful <laughs> and bring joy into our everyday lives, not seeing, be seen as something that uh, we are being deprived of? And so I would hope that we can, you know, shift this <laughs> narrative so that it's not about uh, just, um, you know, uh, deprivation and, and, um, and, you know, like, you know, changing our needs, but really something where we're all working together to a much more sustainable, lower carbon and, and, and much more kind of beautiful and resilient uh, fabric of a landscape that is gonna support us, not uh, uh, harm us and not, not, not expose us to harm. Okay, well, thank you both. I just, uh, there's one last question, which we're not gonna have time to, but I wanna take it away with us and think about it. How do you see the K through 12 education sector playing a role in cultivating a new generation of climate stewards and practitioners. And we are building out K through 12 education in the climate school and uh, aggressively and, and very successfully, and we're keen to do more. So this is something that I think is massively important and we'll, we'll, we'll carry on talking about that after this session. But uh, I just wanna wrap up by uh, thanking Kate and uh, Marco so much for their contributions. It's been a really, really great evening. Um, notwithstanding the te technical difficulties. <clears throat> so um, thanks to all of you for joining us from wherever you are, and thanks for the great questions. Climate change actually requires new forms of scholarship, new knowledge, and, uh, but also a deep commitment to change and a new genera generating a new generation of leaders as well. So this demands collaboration. We're building a school that's like nothing that's ever been built before, one that involves working in transdisciplinary teams and engaging with the world in a way that uh, one doesn't normally uh, think about in when you design a school in particular. So that's part of what we call the fourth purpose of Columbia University, and we're keen to build, build it out going forward. And we very much look forward to um, engaging with you and others as we build out the climate school in this way. Uh, just to say, um, these, um, this work, uh, you know, requires support. And we are great to, grateful for all the people who do give to the Columbia Climate School uh, for our work on sustainability. So thank you very much. And if you uh, can consider making a gift, that would be really great. We look forward to talking with you uh, at the next of these Earth Series events, uh, which will be uh, when we're celebrating Earth Day, uh, which will be with Professor and Dean Emirata of Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, Amal Andreas, and uh, the chair of the Smart Cities Center at Columbia University's Data Science Institute, Andrew Smith. And they'll be talking about the future of cities in particular. So um, I'm Alex Harvey, wishing you all a wonderful evening. Uh, have a healthy few weeks until we see you back here again. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening.